Thank you very much, Bob, as always, and great to see everyone. Um, hopefully you, you'll have read a few of the uh, the notes that I sent through with this, probably why you're here, because Dr. Fiona Meachin, Meachin, Meachin has got a fantastic CV uh, and really interesting. And it won a variety over the past 30 years. Fiona has worked in a range of roles, in a range of organisations, has become ever more curious about why people act in the way that they do. When they find themselves in senior roles in organisations. Part of her biography is that she's worked at director level in the police and local government. She's also studied and taught leadership for a number of years and was the course director for the Police Strategic Command course in 2021 and 22. She's an executive education associate with Lions uh, Manchester Business School, a member of the Institute of Directors and so on and so forth. So she, she's very gifted to be speaking to us tonight. And of course, the subject matter is why compassion is good for business. And my hat, we need a bit of compassion in this nasty old world. So let me pass over immediately to Fiona and shut up for now. So see you later. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, and I might need yourself and Bob just to, to jump in. I might, I've got a little quiz to start with and I don't know if we'll see the chat, but let me start off by um, sharing my screen. Here we go. Fingers crossed it did work before. There we are. Can everybody see that? Okay. Let's give us a nod. Yes, we can. Lovely. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. So first of all, um, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for asking and, and such an important topic. I am very passionate about compassion, um, which I'm sure you will see as we go through. Um, and I also wanted to start off by saying happy International Day of Happiness. Um, I don't know if it was planned that way, Steve, or if it was just a fortuitous happy coincidence. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, today, the International Day of Happiness is apparently about helping people to recognise the importance of happiness in their lives. Um, and compassion is great for happiness. So I think that was a really happy coincidence. Um, so also happy spring equinox and happy Nowruz to those celebrating the Persian New Year. One of my friends is doing that. Um, I could speak to you for days about compassion, compassionate work, compassionate leadership. You will be pleased to know we don't have that much time, <laughs> so you don't have to listen to me for that long. Um, I reckon I'll be going for maybe about 40, 45 minutes with a little bit of um, engagement in the middle. So I hope that's OK. And then there's plenty of time for discussion um, and questions. Uh, I did try and cut it down. <laughs> um, but as you can imagine, there's a, there's a lot to talk about. Um, so I'm going to be scratching the surface of, of quite a lot of concepts, uh, but I'll give you lots of um, sort of uh, links and hints and tips if you want to speak to other people or find out more about any of it. So let's start with a little quiz. Um, if you're interested, I would love you to join in here. Um, unfortunately, I can't see the chat, so I'm going to have to ask Bob and Steve to just give me a little hand here. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, once I ask you the questions, just pop in your little your answers in the chat. Best guess. Um, I'm afraid there's no prize for winners, uh, apart from the, the kudos of, uh, of your colleagues. Um, so let's just start. They're numerical ones, so uh, best guess will do. So first question. This comes from um, ONS figures for 2022. Um, what do we think the number of working days is that was lost due to sickness or injury in 2022 in the UK? And while you're popping your answers into the chat box, I just want to sort of highlight that when we're talking about days lost due to sickness. It includes um, minor sickness, long-term sickness, injuries, mental ill health, stress. Um, and there is, a, there is a school of thought which says something like 80 to 90% of all illness actually is in some way related to stress because of the massive impact that stress can have on our whole body operating systems. So you've got so a range of between five and a hundred million at the minute, Fiona. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a good range. OK, so this is the number of working days um, overall in the UK. Um, and the answer is 186 million. And oh, ONS... actually 300 million. Russ, Russ gets pretty, he probably almost wins the prize there. Why is that? <laughs> well done, Russ. That's what... David Lilly wins. <laughs> well done, David Lilly. Um, Sadly, that's a record high number, or it was in 2022. So there's there's something going on here which is not positive. Um, next question. 
average rate of employee absence. So this is a, this is the smaller number, the number of days per employee per year. And just to give you a clue, um, in 2022, that rate was 5.7 days. So what do we think that rate was in 2023? Answers in the chat, please. How are we looking, Bob? Uh, we've got a range, just looking at it, between the seven, seven and a half, ten, ten, seven, eight, twenty, fifteen, nine, seven, fifteen, nine point eight. Good, some really good guesses in there, and some very close ones. That was seven point eight. So it had gone up from five point seven to seven point eight in the course of a year. Um, well, and this Tim is from Bull wins the prize for that with eight. Oh. Well done, Tim Baldwin, you win the prize. <laughs> um, and that's from the CIPD Health and Wellbeing at Work report. Um, and again, when they reported that, they highlighted it was the highest in a decade. So again, it's gone up substantially. And if we extrapolate the numbers from the year before, which was a record high number the year before, that in 2023 equated to 250 million lost days in the UK. So really big numbers here. Percent of senior managers who are stressed by at least one thing at work. What do we think that might be? This is from an HR software company who polled um, nearly 300 senior managers in the UK. What have we got there in terms of guesses? Uh, 100, uh, 30, 70, 90, 30, Gosh. 65, 38, 75. Wow. Quite a range, great 80. range, great range. Some very optimistic ones there, um, but actually whoever said 100% was the closest. 98% uh, um, of senior managers stressed by at least one thing at work, and that's phenomenal. I don't know whether to be shocked by that or to just think, that well, that was obvious. Um, the things they were stressed about were largely work-related, but people were also stressed in work about things outside of work. So care and responsibility, cost of living as well. And um, 98%, wow. Um, and if it is the case that stress is implicated in 80 to 90% of all illness, that's an absolute tragedy for these people's health and well-being, isn't it? Given that we spend so much time in work. And of course, people don't always go up sick when they're unwell, do they? 98% of senior managers aren't all off sick. Most of them are in work. Um, and the CIPD also has found that presenteeism is um, rampant. And that's where people are unwell, but they are still in work. Um, and when we're unwell, we're just not able to give our best, are we? Um, so lots of people in work and not being able to give their best. So it's an ethical problem because we shouldn't be unwell just by coming to work. Um, but it's also a productivity problem. So it's, it's a bit of a bottom line issue, stress. Um, so I've got some more questions for you, but I'm not going to go through the whole chat thing again. I'm just going to give you the answers. Um, I just want to do some scene setting for you, really. Um, CMI recently found in their Better Management report in 2023 um, that a third of people have left a job due to a negative work culture. A company in the US um, surveyed a range of businesses and found that 57% of staff had left a job due to a bad boss. There are various ranges there, but that, that was one study found that. Um, a report from a company in the hospitality industry found that um, over 80% of people are unsurprisingly tempted to move and go to other companies whose culture is better than the one that they're in. And very much linked to that research by executive networks um, found that um, in relation to chief HR officers, um, again, over 80% reported that they're facing a significant talent retention problem in their businesses. And we know that the cost of turnover can be really high for businesses. Um, Sendex in 2023 estimated that replacing a single employee can take up to 28 weeks um, and cost over £25,000 in lost productivity. Um, and Centric HR estimate that to replace an employee can take um, between six to nine months of their salary. The cost is six to nine months of their salary in addition to lost productivity. So a bit of a snapshot of where we're at. It's not a happy picture, unfortunately. And the point is we've got a picture of large amounts of people who are not well and either not in work or are in, unwell in work and not able to give their best. And we know that a lot of that stress is created in work um, due to poor culture and due to bad bosses. Um, and those things make people want to leave. And so they either do leave 
which costs businesses, um, or they withdraw. So the, the motivation goes down, they withdraw their discretionary effort. And that can be really significant and have a big impact um, on businesses. Um, it also creates things like organisational deviance, which is basically bad behaviour and causing problems in work. Um, and, and people can be organisational terrorists in those circumstances and cause reputational damage. So, visual picture, sorry about that. It's a bit of a roller coaster this presentation. <laughs> So you may be wondering what's all this got to do with um, compassion. So let me tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to start with why, as Simon Sinek would encourage us all to do. Why compassion? What happens when we don't have it? So I'll just give you a bit more of a, an in-depth picture because it's important to shine a light on that so we understand more about the business case. We'll talk about what happens when we do have compassion at work. And that's a bit of a happier picture. You'll be pleased to know. <laughs> um. And then we need to have a bit of a reality check. You know, it is difficult. If it wasn't difficult, we would already have it. So let's understand that. And then we can talk about how we can develop it in workplaces. So is everybody in the right place? Are you all still with me here? <laughs> this is the right presentation, yes? Hopefully. I can't see you all, but I'm hoping that was a, a yes and a, a thumbs up. Oh, good. <laughs> a good few. <laughs> so let's start off with why compassion. Um. I came to this uh, when I watched this TED talk by Karen Armstrong. So some of you might be familiar with it. If you're not, um, I would recommend that you watch it. It's from back in 2008, which, which seems quite old now, um, and it won the TED Prize that year. Karen Armstrong is a religious historian, and she studied all of the world's major religious, spiritual and ethical traditions. And she's found consistently that compassion is the one thing that underpins all of them. In addition, we know from developmental psychology that even the youngest children very naturally demonstrate helping and caring behaviours. It comes very naturally to them. And we know from anthropology and from archaeology that compassion has helped us to survive and to evolve as a species. So for me, all of that suggests that compassion is a really fundamental part of humanity. It cuts across a whole host of disciplines and it really is part of who we are as individuals um, and as societies. Caveat is sometimes people with particular disorders might not be capable of feeling empathy or, or compassion. And sometimes the experiences that we have in life um, lead us to withholding compassion for, for various reasons. Uh, but most of us do start out with it, with compassion as part of our being. But curiously, for a range of reasons, it rarely makes its way into the workplace. Um, and having worked in quite a wide range of organisations over 35 years um, and having seen a lot of that for from, from myself and heard lots of stories from others. And um, Steve and I were just talking at the start about how we know so many people who've been bruised by organisations from, from bad behaviour in organisations. So I've always been a bit confused about that. Where's our humanity gone in organisations? And I've always been curious about it. So curious, in fact, that I've completed a PhD in compassionate work, which on reflection is probably slightly excessive, but here we are nonetheless. <laughs> um, so what do I mean by compassion? Um, well, what do you think? So again, I'm just going to just ask you to just pop a few words in the chat. What do you under understand compassion to be, please? Just humour me here. Chuck a few words at me. Um, how would you explain compassion? And I'll just ask Bob to just shout out some words at me, please, once they come in. Empathy, generosity to self and others, understanding the needs of others, kindness. Yeah. Um, that's what we've got so far. Brilliant. Brilliant. And all no, of those are really, really... Sorry, what was that last one? Kindness and understanding. understanding seeing yeah. things from other people's perspective as well. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, as you can imagine, I've done a lot of reading around compassion. There are lots of um, explanations out there, lots of definitions um, and lots of crossover. So absolutely spot on there. Lots of words such as sympathy, empathy, care, kindness, benevolence, love. And all of those words help us to understand what it is in principle. Um, but I think we need more clarity, especially if we're talking about it in relation to work. Um, Back in 2017, I wrote a thing called the Compassion at Work Toolkit on behalf of the National Forum for Health and Wellbeing at Work. And I'll give you a link for that later on. Um, and, and this is where I came to with like, keep giving us a really simple definition. Even before empathy, you need to notice, you need to be aware of what's going on around about you. You need to be aware of other people. 
Um, and then you have to have empathy. And that's about putting yourself in other people's shoes and being able to really resonate with how they might be feeling and understanding how other people might be feeling. And the thing that demarcates empathy from compassion is action. So you empathise, but then you want to take some action to improve the circumstances of the others. Um, and one of the great things about compassion is that it doesn't have to be grand gestures. We know that people can feel compassion um, from sometimes the smallest kind acts of um, recognition um, and just kindness and benevolence. Um, so there's a fantastic ripple effect with compassion, which we'll talk a bit more about later as well. Uh, but for me, this gives us real hope because I think it's a simple model and it's definitely something that we can all do. It's, it's achievable. Um, and like most things, we can get better at it if we practice. My thinking has developed a bit since 2017, and I'll, I'll talk about that later. But I think this is a really good starting point. So compassion is fundamentally about improvement for me. A lot of authors talk about compassion being in response to suffering, but it doesn't have to be. You can just meet people where they are. That doesn't have to be a place of suffering, but it's about meeting them where they are and continually trying to work together to help people improve circumstances. And so for me, this is where it can be really linked closely into work and organisations, because we talk in organisations a lot, don't we, about continuous improvement individually and collectively. So you can see how that would fit well um, in organisations because we can help to operationalise continuous improvement by using compassion in organisations. A couple of little caveats I just want to highlight before we go any further. Um, one is that, um, especially in relation to compassionate leadership in particular, um, compassion on its own isn't enough, actually. Um, we need to re recognise that compassion takes great courage and what I mean by that is in the face of the toxic cultures and the bad behaviors that we know go on and that make people want to leave organizations compassion demands that we stand up and challenge those things and we know that that's not easy so it takes courage to be compassionate this is not just about being nice to people it's about challenging and dealing with bad behavior as well so it takes courage and alongside compassion and courage, um, we also need competence. And I just think it's important to, to say that. Um, it's of course imperative that leaders know their business um, and they've got the right skills and abilities in relation to organizational and operational leadership, um, as well as people leadership, which is where compassion really comes in. Um, because compassion is about uh, building human relations. It can really help to elevate and enhance those other um, skills and abilities by bringing people together. But we do need competence um, in there as well. I just think it was important to highlight that. So what happens when we don't have compassion? Okay, hold on to that great news that's gone before. We know what compassion is and we know it's eminently achievable, which is really great news. This next bit gets a little bit dark and I apologize for that, um, especially on International Day of Happiness, but I think it's really important to shine a light on what is happening out there and what people are experiencing in some of our organizations um, because it helps to make the case for compassion. So what happens when we don't have it? Okay. Research has found that um, a lack of empathy and a lack of compassion is, is really closely associated with unethical practice in organisations. And at the most extreme end, we can see some really highly unethical practices with some really horrific outcomes, actually. This first picture here really is, is about some of the care scandals that we've experienced in the NHS. So the Mid Staffordshire Hospitals Review was, was probably one of the worst, but there have been many since then. Winterbourne View, lots of different maternity services where people should have been cared for, but ended up suffering in the most heartbreaking ways. And, and people ended up dying who didn't need to die because of toxic cultures and bad leadership. In policing, we've had cover-ups, we've had Hillsborough, we've had cover-ups around child sexual exploitation, and again, where people should have been protected, and they weren't. And what some of these investigations have thrown up after these events um, is that there have, you know, the cover-ups have been a result of um, senior leaders having more care for organisational reputation than for people. More care for organisational reputation for them for the human beings who have been very badly affected by some of these awful practices. And of course, the irony is that 
organisational reputation is ultimately shattered by what emerges. So it's a bit of a pointless task. <clears throat> Excuse me. In other sectors too, pharmaceutical companies vastly increasing prices of critical medications to take big profits at the cost of people suffering. Car manufacturers lying about emissions tests. More recently, um, the awful horizon scandal. You know, why did it take a TV dramatisation to highlight the scale and the human cost of such a scandal to be taken seriously? And all of these things show a lack of compassion for individuals, uh, for communities, for the environment, um, organisations that are really keen to protect themselves. And when I say organisations, we need to remember that organisations are just a collection of people, you know, so individual senior leaders make organisations and make some of these decisions. And we do have to lay responsibility with individuals. It's really important that individuals get held to account. Um, there, there is a there is a real issue around how senior leaders become attached to organisations. I'm not going to go into it in, in, in detail here. Dr Jen Fraser has done some really fantastic work um, in this arena, but it is linked to how belonging is a really core human need and attachment is a really core human trait. And people um, sometimes misjudge that and become very attached to organisations at the expense of being a decent human being and doing the right thing. Um, so it is a real phenomenon. And again, we need to shine a light on that to understand it, to be able to do something about it. Just a few more ones that I'm just gonna highlight quite briefly. One of the worst ones I came across, and, and again, this is, you know, these things are consistent the world over. It's not just in the UK. Um, there's an example of France Telecom which is one of the worst overt cases I've ever come across. And between 2008 and 2011, 69 members of staff took their own lives and many of them in the workplace. Um, and that was found to be as a result of a really deliberate strategy by management to create a toxic environment, to destabilise relationships in the workplace and push staff out of the organisation. And clearly that's an appalling example. Um, and really shows the lens that people in senior leadership positions will go to when their compassion and humanity dissolves. A few others which I shall canter through. I'm sure you've seen very recently published a report um, by the House of Commons Treasury Committee, um, which identifies horrific bullying, harassment and crime in the workplaces in financial services in um, companies in the city. Um, they found that organisations are silencing victims, forcing them out and protecting perpetrators. I don't know about you, but that sounds like an organised crime group to me. <laughs> How is that happening in legitimate business in 2024? We've, we've got to question that. Another example, sadly, in the RAF and the Red Arrows, recent investigation, very similar, bullying, harassment crimes happening in work in an environment where these things have been normalised and not challenged. Another failure of decent humanity, another failure of compassion, sadly. CBI people I'm sure will be um, familiar with this case, more of the same, some horrific behaviour going on in work being uncovered, having terrible impact on victims who've just gone to work to do the day job, um, and of course a real financial cost too to the organisation. So many high profile paying members walking away when these things come to light, quite rightly, of course. This is one of the most ironic ones I've come across, a company that call themselves Ethical Social Group, <laughs> apparently founded on um, a passion to create safe, inclusive and fun environments and removing nasties. Um, and it's a shame that they didn't remove the nasties from their own organisation because very recently it's been reported um, as a result of an in, uh, employment tribunal, <coughs> excuse me, CEO reported bullying and unethical business practices to the group CEO. She subsequently was subjected to detrimental treatment by the employer after she whistle blew. Um, it was ruled that she had been then constructively unfairly dismissed and ethical social group had to pay out £185,000 in compensation. So not only was the organisation not ethical at all, but the practices also cost them a hefty chunk of money. It's a bottom line issue. 
Vincent Deary, if you're interested in his work, talks about how stress is embodied in us. So I mentioned that before. It impacts on all of our bodily systems. And he talks about his experiences in the NHS, witnessing people being physically worn out by toxic environments. And he talks about how work can break people. I won't go into the detail of um, Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham, um, but again, some horrendous findings and again, a corrosive culture and poor leadership being found. This is endemic um, and, and we know that it's still happening. So only this week, the health service ombudsman has been in the news saying he believes that there's a cover up culture in the NHS where reputation management is prioritised. That sounds familiar. Um, and whistleblowers are victimised also sounds familiar. Um, and again, we know that patient care suffers as a result um, when we have such toxic and unethical approaches. People literally die in healthcare environments because of it. And we know it costs organisations money. So as one example, very recently, North Tees and Hartlepool NHS Trust has had to pay out nearly a million pounds to two whistleblowers who were victimised after um, the whistleblow so it's a bottom line issue. It makes no business sense to operate in this way. This is another example from um, politics, Westminster. I'm not going to go into the details. Um, Jennifer and Adele is great. She does some good work on compassion in politics. She's at Stanford University, if you're interested. I'm just going to skip over this one for the moment. Um, the next one, um, this is just, what I want to illustrate is that um, those cases are very high profile cases. I'm going to talk a tiny bit about policing. There have been loads of examples from policing, haven't they? We've got the Casey Review, the Angelini Review, highlighting just the most despicable behaviour in some of our organisations. I've found some of that in my own research. But it's not just the big high profile cases that make the news. I think the most dangerous and insidious practice is the stuff that happens every single day. And that's the stuff we really need to, to shine a light on. Um, it's that low, lower level damaging behaviour, which just gets normalised in many places and not challenged. Um, so this is, this is just a tiny example. It was a tweet actually from a few years ago, but the point is individuals and organizations can do very unethical things. Um, these were two people who'd lost their home, had been living in the car. Police officer did the right thing. They, they seized the car. They had no insurance, I suppose, by the letter of the law, they did the right thing. But then they took a picture and they shamed them for you know people at their lowest. And what is it that makes an individual do that in an organization? We've got to ask how we get to the place where an individual thinks that that's okay. But we all work in a wider context and employees often reflect that context and that culture of an organisation. So it's the everyday bad behaviour, it's the drip, drip, drip effect, I think, that turns people quite bad in organisations. So it's, it's things like... Um, Managers only being interested in targets being delivered, no interest in what happens to the people who don't have the resources to deliver them. Just get it done. Just get it done. Or no interest in the quality of the products. I've literally had it said to me, excuse my mild bit of swearing, um, it doesn't matter if it's a shit product, it just needs to be delivered. Well, it does matter. <laughs> it does matter. How have you become like that? So disengaged. Change management, organisations implementing change, no meaningful consultation, they just do it to people. People expected to deliver more for less all the time. Um, and people dealing with wider life issues, you, you often hear managers saying, you keep those issues outside of work, that's not a work issue. But people are dealing with things like illness, bereavement, caring responsibilities. And it is ridiculous to think that as human beings, we can take our brain and heart out and put them in a locker before we go to work. We are complete human beings when we go to work. So all of this unreasonable and toxic behaviour in the workplace leads to people feeling very undervalued, unappreciated and dehumanised. Um, and all of that is the antithesis of compassion. And all of that stops us from giving our best in work. So much of the academic research into compassionate work does start from the position of thinking that actually workplaces just cause suffering. Um, I do want to emphasise, by the way, you know, there are many, many great leaders out there. Of course there are. I find it in my own research in policing. There are some really, really fantastic people working in policing, fantastic leaders. But the big problem is often people get drowned out by the culture. 
which is bigger than them. And that happens in lots of organisations. And suffering at work isn't new. Uh, you know, the, the, the whole concept of putting profits over people, hard management practices over humanity, compounded by work intensification. All of these things have been happening for many, many years um, and arguably getting worse. And when we suffer in work, um, you know, it, it's, it's a productivity issue. It's an ethical problem. And it's also about productivity, as I've said before. There's lots of academic evidence to show that when there's a lack of compassion at work, um, there's increased resentment and anger. There's poor relationships in work, conflict, bullying, other deviant workplace behaviour. Um, and all of that takes our focus away from delivering the day job. So it's a real productivity issue. You know, none of this makes any business sense. And we've talked about costs. Of course, it generates costs for individuals and for organizations when that happens. So for me, empathy and compassion are really essential in the workplace if we're gonna turn this round and improve our circumstances in any way, shape or form. Um, and I can, would contend that we cannot continue to ignore it in work. We have to actively do something about it in terms of bringing empathy and compassion into the workplace. So, deep breath, everybody. I'm sorry about that. That was horrendous. That was very depressing, pulling all those figures together, I have to tell you, in those case studies. Um, so let's flip it around a little bit. Are you all still with me? Yes, yep. we are. Yes, we are. Just about. Okay, great. Thank you. I love this quote from Maya Angelou. I always love Maya Angelou anyway. Do the best you can until you know better. Okay. I don't think we've been doing the best we can. Nonetheless, when you know better, do better. We do know better. We know that compassion can make a difference in work. So what happens when we have compassion in work, right? Let's get back to this International Day of Happiness and lift this up a bit, shall we? Um, so before I mentioned that compassion has a bit of a ripple effect, and in organisations, there's evidence to show that there are benefits in four, four levels from compassion at work. So the first person that benefits, as you might imagine, is the person on the receiving end of the compassion. You know, that's the point of compassion, isn't it? It's to make somebody feel better. There's also evidence to show that people demonstrating compassion will feel better. There's something about being compassionate that's good for the soul. Interestingly, there's also evidence to show that people who witness compassionate acts feel better as a result. And through that ripple effect, that emotional contagion, whole organisations can start to benefit from people demonstrating small acts of compassion. OK, so there, there are choices to be made. The flip side of that is, again, I would implore you to go and watch it. There's a great TED talk by Professor Christine Porath, which I've shared on LinkedIn today, actually. So just go and have a wee look at that. And she talks about incivility at work and how incivility acts like a virus. When we have rudeness and disrespect in the workplace, it can ripple out. Um, the good news is compassion has the, the same effect. And so as leaders, we can make a choice we can make a choice. Are we going to instigate infectious incivility and allow that to infect our organisations? Or as leaders, are we going to make a choice to cultivate contagious compassion and let that ripple out instead? So we do have some control over this as leaders and leaders demonstrating compassion can impact positively on the whole organisation. Many of us know instinctively, I think, that well-being is a business critical issue. I think I've shown that, I hope I have. And thank goodness that recently more and more organizations are really recognizing that it is a bottom line issue for businesses. So what do we know when we have compassion at work? I'm just gonna give it all on one slide here. Um, there is more, these are just headlines from lots and lots of research. There's a lot more research coming out every day. And we know that when we have compassion in our organizations, we have more ethical leadership, which counteracts that really unethical practice, and um, which does so much damage that we've highlighted before. And there are loads of really other positive outcomes from com compassion at work. So um, outcomes for individuals, better health, resilience, job satisfaction, better outcomes from organisations, better organisation commitment, reduced turnover, and all these great things that improve productivity, innovation, collaboration, etc. And all of these essentially lead to improved well-being and improved productivity. So if we build on the Maya Angelou quote that we just had before, when people feel better, they can do better. 
So being a decent human being in work is good for individuals and it's good for business. And I just want to highlight as well that it's not just the right approach in normal times. It is the right approach in normal times. It's also critical in times of crisis. So there have been loads of different studies um, of organisations who have seen real crisis situations. Um, and there have been studies of those organisations who have demonstrated compassion towards staff compared to those who haven't. So just some examples here. This this one is was the flooding in the Brisbane Central Business District um, and the 9-11 attacks, the recent pandemic. Um, all of these studies have found that where organisations responded to staff at a time of crisis, when they responded to staff in a compassionate way, putting human needs before business needs, the long-term payback for them was huge. What happened when they treated people with compassion was people's pride and gratitude towards the organisation improved, better organisational commitment, more psychological connection to one another, so better team working, better resilience, people coming back to work sooner, and even people coming back to work and having improved productivity to what they had before. So it's important to shine a light on that. It's, it, you know, compassion, we can't park compassion at times of crisis. That's when we need it even more. But clearly we don't have it all the time. So what, what is it? Why is it so difficult? Why do we not have this great secret sauce in our organisations? Because it makes such a great difference. If we know it's so good, why are we not doing it? So we've already talked, haven't we, about sort of many, many outdated work practices and beliefs, which sadly really endure and are really embedded and entrenched in the cultures of our organisations profits over people, harsh management over humanity. Um, and those are really entrenched in a lot of places. And we do need to, to break that. In addition, it's more complex. Again, I'll give you the headlines, but we do have problems with empathy, unfortunately. Um, we know that if we empathise too closely with other people, if we take on other people's pain, it can make us ill. Um, and therefore, you're less able to give empathy and you can become ill yourself. A bigger problem, I think, is empathy bias. So people like people like themselves. So people will empathise with people and be kinder to people who are like them. Um, and actually that can cause more problems than it solves. Another big problem is when we're under great stress and we have lots of, lots of work and overwhelm, we can become a bit closed down and dissociated. Um, and therefore it's harder to demonstrate empathy. Where we want to get to is a place where we can demonstrate unconditional compassion, where we can truly believe that all life is of equal value and we can respond with positive emotion, caring, warmth and act to relieve discomfort in a way that is not damaging to us in a way that is not biased and causing more damage in the long run. The good news is we know we can develop compassion. We have to do it carefully because actually, I won't go into the detail, but we don't want to develop empathy because <laughs> it can be really damaging. What we want to develop is compassion and we know that we can. Um, and so that is really, really good news. Some other barriers that have been identified by Rolfie Park, organisational culture, individual circumstances, policies and procedures. I would argue that all of these things really come under the banner of organisational culture which is one of the biggest challenges, I think, um, to compassion at work. So knowing that, how can we foster compassion at work? Well, happily, we can do it in lots of different ways, <laughs> um, but I'm not going to tell you them all today. So here's the link for you. This is uh, my first little freebie for you today. Um, there are lots of ways we can foster compassion at work, and I would encourage you to read this. So the Compassionate Work Toolkit, as I said, I wrote a few years ago, um, for the um, Forum for Health and Wellbeing at Work. There's a range of hints and tips there about how we can embed compassion at work, looking at the whole employee life cycle. It's had many thousands of reads in all different countries all over the world, which I'm thrilled about, and I know it gets used in, in training in various places. So please have a look at that, use it, share it widely. Um, I'm not gonna talk about everything, but I wanted to mention a couple of things. And the first thing I wanted to mention was self-compassion. You know when you go on an aircraft, 
we all get told to fit our own oxygen masks before helping others. And of course, that's because if we can't breathe, we can't help other people. You have to start with yourself. Um, and when you are self-compassionate, it's easier to be compassionate towards other people. You can't pour from an, an empty jug. So there's lots of evidence to show that self-compassion generates personal resilience, generates happiness, reduces stress and anxiety, um, and puts us in a better place to demonstrate compassion towards others. I've got a whole session on self-compassion. <laughs> We're not going to go there today. We don't have the time. Um, but if you're interested in more, have a look at the work of Dr. Um, Kristen Neff in the US um, and our own Dr. Amanda Super um, in the UK, which leads me nicely on to my second freebie that I've got for you today. Um, which is from Dr. Amanda Super. Um, she's a chartered organisational psychologist who works in the UK, like me, has a passion for compassion, um, and she's got a focus on developing compassionate leadership. She's developed um, an online self-compassion at work programme, which takes about eight hours. It's just totally self-directed. You can do it in your own time. And she's very, off very kindly offered up 25 free places. This was normally cost about £40 for each course um, and I promise you there's no link to selling to this it's just a genuine offer and um, if you would like to develop your self-compassion if you want to know more about it you can access it through the link and just use the discount code when it comes to the checkout and you can have that course for free first come first served I'll just ask you to notice your reaction to that if you think oh compassion is a load of rubbish I don't want that um you probably need it more so i would really encourage you to take up that offer please um and and huge thanks to amanda for giving us that for free no link sale and i promise <laughs> um so the other thing i wanted to mention just alongside self-compassion is um organizational culture like i say i just think it's has such a massive impact it's about the way we do things in an organisation, isn't it? It's the shared values and assumptions that we that we have in organisations. And there are lots of theories about culture, but one theory is that it's the result of behaviour of leaders, organisational values and organisational socialisation. Just going to focus on leaders, given that we're in the leaders club. Um, and there are lots of things that leaders can do to help embed compassion in organizations we've already talked about modeling compassion haven't we demonstrating compassion encourages other people to do the same so modeling and normalizing care concern for others respect civility in the workplace and normalizing challenging and dealing with bad behavior really really important that leaders are seen to be doing that We know about the importance of leaders and managers in organisations. Previous speakers have raised it. Baroness Dido Harding mentioned it the other day. As soon as she said that, I was like, yes, yes. <laughs> um, Professor Claire Collins mentioned the importance of senior leadership from the top when we're trying to embed EDI, and it's the same here. Leaders are critically important, and we have to remember the human element of leadership. Um, my colleague Joe Wright tells a really powerful story about the importance of leadership. Um, I'm not going to tell it here, but if you want to see that, you can check her out in, on LinkedIn. The King's Fund write about it extensively. We know how important compassionate leadership is in the NHS. Jamie Karen Lima, one of the most successful business women in the US, knows the importance of treating staff well. Timson, I make no apology for mentioning Timson again. I think virtually everybody who speaks here talks about Timsons, but they are they are fantastic. They recognise the importance of taking care of their employees in terms of being a successful business. And if you want more great examples, there are lots of places you can look for examples of people who are doing good things in business. I won't go through these. It's just a couple of examples of organisations who are in the great places to work and um, top 100 and the reason they're there is because they have great culture and they have great leadership and the staff feel it. The biggest problem we've got, um, which I also think is our biggest opportunity, um, is the lack of good quality management and skills and abilities and leadership skills and abilities, especially when it comes to people leadership in organisations. We know CMI say it very clearly. We have a bit of an endemic, an epidemic of accidental managers who come into leadership roles with no formal training in people leadership. And when we do have people leadership, it's really patchy. Um, and that really rings true with my own findings in policing as well. Very much the same. 
So we know that we have an opportunity here to make a difference with our leaders, and it is definitely time for training in compassionate leadership. The great news is we can develop it. It can be done. It will be good for business. We just need to have the will to make sure that it happens. I mentioned earlier that you know we can use the, the compassionate model, the, the process as a basis for developing our compassionate leaders. I said earlier, my thinking has developed since then. Um, I now think there are five stages, essentially. We start with self-compassion. We develop our own humanity in work, self-understanding, awareness, getting clear about our values. And then we develop our competence in relation to really paying attention, visibility, psychological safety, active listening. We develop our competence in relation to really understanding our people, staff engagement, good quality understanding. And we develop our competence in relation to taking a really values driven and ethically led action approach organisationally and operationally throughout the whole employee life cycle. There are other ways of developing compassionate leaders, but I just wanted to quickly share my framework on that to show you that it is practically possible. It is achievable. And, and hopefully that gives us some hope for the future that we, we can do this. The key message I want you to, to leave you with um, is that you know, there's a lot of human complexity which sits behind compassion, why we don't have compassion at work, but we can start small and we can keep it simple. We can start from a place of suspending our judgment of other people, which we're all really bad at doing. We can seek to really understand other people and where they are. And we can support people with action and kindness. Empathy plus action equals compassion. If we start from that basis in the workplace, people will feel more valued, they'll be healthier and they'll be able to be more productive. So being a decent human being in work is the right thing. It's the most ethical thing to do, and it is good for business. I hope I've made that case quite clearly. So thank you so much for listening to my um, ramblings, my evangelical ramblings about compassion. I hope I didn't send anyone off to sleep. There's a couple of um, links there. There's a link to my research profile if you wanted to see any more um, research about compassionate work and compassionate leadership it's there it's free um, and my contact details are there if you want to get in touch and I would just love to hear from you about what you think what you think we need to do next to improve things in our organizations thank you uh, Fiona fantastic thanks very much indeed really uh, really really interesting um, I'll just take the slides down oh, okay. uh, sorry I've done it um, oh. And I've allowed people to unmute themselves, so uh, please do uh, rack up your questions if you have some. There are one or two appearing in chat that Fiona, you probably can now see as well, but I'll bring those out for you if the uh, if necessary. Um, I'm going to shamelessly nick the first one, if I may. Um, I mean, one of the reasons I do what I do is because of some of the stuff you're talking about. I mean, I haven't come out of 34 years plus of military um, experience and leadership, then going into the corporate world, I, I completely agree that leadership in corporates is is very patchy i mean there's some great examples but there are also some really terrible ones and yep. and organized leadership training is a relative rarity i think it's yes. it's getting better with some of the organizations i work with thank goodness um but uh, there are plenty that it is it really isn't on the compassion point i just i'm really interested in your perspective about how much if any of it you see is generational in terms of challenge because I think there is, from what I see with some of the work I do, um, you've got younger generation now who are very different to my kind of generation, for sure, in terms of their expectations, the likelihood of them staying in one job for any period of time, all that sort of thing as well. Uh, and the fact that you know they are just different to the older generation. And that can lead, I think, to some, well, come on, just get on with it. You know, we had to do it, so you need to, you need to do it too, kind of write a passage almost. I just wonder whether you, how much of that you see and what your reflections on that are. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely true. I think, you know, people talk about, you know, Gen, Gen Z and millennials uh, just not standing for it. And I think that's why we've got that figure of 83% willing to just walk away from jobs that have got bad cultures and go somewhere where the culture is better. Um, the problem I see, and definitely the problem um, that I found in, in policing, and I'm sure it's absolutely the same in other places, I talked to my NHS students about it as well, is um, 
how easy it is to assimilate into a culture. I think that's a big problem. So I think what we've, we definitely see in policing, young people coming in um, really motivated by compassion, actually, and, and public service values. Um, and I'm sure going to other organisations with, with similar, um, but very, very quickly getting assimilated into a really strong, dominant culture. Um, and so it's, so it's difficult then, as much as they might want to, you know, come in wanting to challenge, and I will make this better, I will challenge, it's, it's, we know that it's not always easy. Um, I do think people want to, and they're less tolerant of um, that impact on their well-being. Also, you know, uh, like one of my friends had had um, shared that, like I said before, about people from tech companies leaving organisations um, and taking massive pay cuts to go to other organisations um, because they're not willing to compromise their health and well-being anymore. And I think that it, it is perhaps a bit more characteristic of younger generations. Maybe that's a sweeping generalisation, but it does seem to be the case. Um, I like the, the the quote that somebody said. I can't remember who it was, unfortunately, but um, you know there is a generation of people who say, well. I had to put up with it and it didn't do me any harm. <laughs> um, and if that's if that's your attitude, it, it did actually do you some harm <laughs> because that's not what you want. You shouldn't want that for other people. You should want better for the people who come after you. Um, so yeah, I do think there's a bit of generational stuff and we have to be really, really careful um, about watching for that assimilation into cultures because that's where it falls down and that's where we just keep getting more of the same and more of the same. I'm not sure how we how we break that until we deal with seeing the no, I agree with you. I, I think that there is a um, another piece to it as well, which is some of it's just unintentional. Uh, I think there are people who, you know, they, they say the wrong thing. They don't actually mean to say the wrong thing. That's just the way they've, the life they've lived and so on. So Gosh, yes, yeah. You know, I think that is that's certainly a factor, but no, that's really helpful. Thanks. Um, Paul, please. Uh, thanks, uh, Fiona. Thanks very much indeed. I, I'm 100% behind you. I, I think it's fantastic to uh, uh, what you're doing. Um, and I, you know, I couldn't agree more about the sort of cultural uh, business of trying to you know, change the culture of an organization or make sure that the organization is, uh, is, is, has the right culture to be compassionate. Um, I, I'm interested, though, in you know, I think you just flashed up something that said, you know, you, you're, th these are a bunch of companies who are in the 100 best companies to work for, which I assume, therefore, probably says that they have a compassionate culture uh, within them. How, how do they measure that? Um, and how would a company determine whether they've got that right culture? I'll just uh, I mean, I recognize it's a big subject, but just a few indications of, of how you've seen that done well. Yes, it's a tricky one. So those ones that I flashed up and said, you know, if you want some good examples, um, you know, there are lots of companies out there, like the Good Places to Work and, and other organisations who um, who will accredit organisations um, who have good cultures or, you know, are really inclusive, um, great staff surveys. Those, you know, they use, they go into organisations and they use a range of measures. So some of them will look at staff surveys, some of them will interview a range of staff and look at other sorts of measures as well. Um, I, I don't imagine that any of them are infallible. I'm sure they've all kind of got their own faults. And I know from from leading inspections when I worked in GMP, um, you show your best sides, don't you, when you're being, being inspected? You know, all companies will do that. Um, and, and you won't show the darker side um, of the organisation. And I'm absolutely sure some of that goes on as well. So some of the organisations that will be in the, the top 100 maybe don't always deserve to be there you know I'm, I'm, none of it's infallible um but i do think we need to start looking to places that you know, like timson's for example it gets wheeled out again and again and again but you know they they're doing well they're about to open another 50 shops this year um and and you know there, there is something particular about that culture that we can learn from so recognizing that none of these places are perfect necessarily i think we do need to learn from places that are doing it relatively well compared to some of the horrific ones that I gave you at the start. Um, as I say, I don't think it's, it, none of it's infallible really, but it gives us a guide. I don't know if that helps. Okay, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, Barry, please. Uh, thank you, Bob, and thank you very much indeed, Fiona. That was, that, that was really fascinating. You, you, you spoke quite a lot about the workplace and organisational culture in the workplace when, you know, you, you have the workforce, you know, you can eyeball them, they're there. With the new sort of models of working going forward and more remote working now, has there very much um, been done by way of research? And do the toolkits 
sort of cover that. Um, I mean, some of it's going to be glaringly obvious, but uh, has, there, has there been any sort of empirical work been done to, to sort of look at this? Thank you. That's a, a great question, Barry. Thank you. It's not something I've looked at, actually. I've not looked into it. And so I agree it'd be really interesting to, to look at that. I think one of the big things um, about, you know, fundamental human needs. So I talk about compassion as a fundamental um, human condition. And, and a big part of that is about sort of belonging and attachment um, and, and feeling that you're part of something. And that can be difficult when you're working remotely, you know, and we obviously have so much more of that. Um, the, the toolkit, when I wrote the, the toolkit, it was before pandemic time. So before we had much more home working. And so I think I agree it would be really interesting to to have a look and just see how that pans out. I think a lot of the employee life cycle stuff, you know, you, you could embed it just the same, you know, so you're doing values based recruitment, for example, to be really clear about what you expect from people coming into the organisation, your induction, you really embed in compassion to the induction process um, into reward and recognition, performance management. Um, you know, all of those things you can still embed, but there's probably something a bit particular about how we manage and lead people in a remote way and um, perhaps you have to check in a bit more I'm not sure I'm guessing to be honest because I think that's a really it's a really great question a really great area um, to look at it's really interesting as well in relation to sort of artificial intelligence and how that kind of starts to creep into organizations and what that means for compassion and there's, there's a whole there's a whole host of other <laughs> considerations um, to be had there as well, especially in healthcare, for example, artificial intelligence can help a lot with uh, with decision making, for example, in healthcare. But can it really do anything in terms of empathy and compassion? Do we still need humans in the workplace for that? I think we do still need humans in the workplace for that to be authentic. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot more work to be done in that area, Barry. Thank you. Great question. Carol, please. Um, great presentation and thank you, Fiona, really very, very enlightening. Um, you and I both work in what we regard probably as healthy workplace cultures. How do we get to those organisations who pride themselves on an unhealthy workplace culture, who pride themselves on a toxic culture? And I see by your face it's a bit like one of those horrible questions. And it's, it's just really difficult. I was just wondering if you had any enlightening moments that you could pass on from the top of your head. It's lovely to see you, Carol, but I wish you hadn't <laughs> asked that question. <laughs> oh, gosh, what, what a problem. You know, when I did my research in policing, I, I asked for people who were, uh, you know, interested in, in leadership. I want, you know, I wanted to interview people about leadership. And invariably, you get those people who are interested in leadership and passionate about it. So they've gone out there and they've done the research and they're doing it well because they've trained themselves. Um. And the people I'm not getting to are the ones that you're describing, you know, the ones who've come through the ranks. I mean, I'm placing as an example, but it will be the same in other organisations. People who've come through the ranks and seen the people above them do well through behaving really badly and, and being promoted. And that's it's a massive problem. And I, I, I'm stumped with it, if I'm honest. Um, and I think a few of us need to get our heads together to really think about how we do that. I think there is something about... Um, really highlighting and shining a light on the trailblazers the ones who are doing good shining a light on all the, the the great evidence which shows that it works but we also need to be really really acutely aware of why it doesn't work um, and so that thing i mentioned at the start about um you know people as they get more senior in organizations um dr jen fraser i mentioned before does some great work on this and she says you know the more power we give people the less empathy they have and I'm not sure that's always true. It doesn't definitely doesn't have to be true. Um, but you know, you can see it out there for sure. Um and and you know, those are the ones we want to work with, really, but those are the ones that it's really hard to get to. But there is something about shining a light on why why are people so lacking in um empathy by the time they get more senior? And there is something deep in our psychology about that sense of belonging and attachment to the organization. Um and, and so we need to help senior leaders really raise their self-awareness and raise awareness of problems like that because I think that's a starting point isn't it is recognizing that this stuff isn't necessarily 
easy and actually not blaming people you know a lot of people find themselves in leadership positions having learned from bad leaders <laughs> and it's not necessarily their fault you know it's because they haven't had any better development you know as bob said the the, the leadership development out there is either patchy or non-existent um and when it is there we're not really sure we're teaching the right things so i think there's a huge mountain to climb there in terms of um how we deliver leadership development from entry level and all the way through organizations and not just training courses you know a huge amount of leadership development is about learning from other people learning from experience and critically reflecting on some of that and we need to help people to do that um, and we're just not doing it at the minute we're just not doing it and i think that's how we get to people so it's the long game isn't it it's it's, it's never it's never going to be a quick fix sadly yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks. I'll pick some from chat in a minute, but Beverly? Yeah, there's so much you've said there, um, Fiona, that I, especially that piece around, the last piece around leadership development, I think a lot of it has to be about personal development. And I'm also really, <clears throat> this isn't my question, but I'm really interested in this piece about attachment and the relationship between early years, your early parenting, early caregiving, and then your attachment style and how that then plays out in the workplace. I think that's massive. So I should go off and have a look at Jen's work on that. But also I'm interested in whether your research revealed anything about the people that have no capacity or very limited capacity for self-compassion. And that gets shaped away, I think, as we grow, we learn not to be self-compassionate. And often we have to relearn how to do it. But I have worked with people who have massive compassion for other people and can operate and extend that towards people that work for them, cannot extend anything towards themselves. And I was wondering about the author, whether your research revealed anything about the authenticity of how the compassion, the receipt, how the, the, the receiver of the compassion perceives that compassion whether there's something about authenticity in that. You know, there are people who can be compassionate and go through the motion. There yeah. are people who can be genuinely compassionate but have no compassion for themselves. I just wondered whether there's anything that came out in your work. Oh, so interesting, Beverly. Yes. Um, I'm saying yes. Yeah, so I haven't actually explored that myself. <laughs> I'm excited about it because I think that's really important. Um, I think what we do know is... Uh, people are not stupid you know if you're being inauthentic generally okay. people can spot it mm -hmm. you know when leadership you know when leaders are not authentic people can see that so if they're not authentically compassionate people will know that they don't really mean it um, and therefore it's just a bit pointless so we do know that for compassion to be effective it has to be authentic and people spot it when it's not um the issue about people being able to give compassion but not to themselves is is fascinating and you know there is research which shows some people are actually afraid of compassion they're afraid of receiving compassion um and I'm, that's what i mean when i talk about there's so much human complexity that sits beyond all this you know psychological complexity that sits sits below it and you know same with the issues you've mentioned about to do with attachment i'm sure lots of it comes from childhood stuff um and also some people you know, think compa receiving compassion is a bit of a weakness and that that's more of an ego thing and that's more of a lack of knowledge, lack of learning thing. So I think to some extent we can help people understand why it's important and we can help people, we can encourage people to take up compassion and be more self-compassionate if we make the case that actually fit your own oxygen mask first. If you're self-compassionate, you will be able to be a better leader but we need to make the case and I don't think we've done that really well enough um but like you I'm really I'm really interested in that I, I don't have an answer I'm afraid I'm sorry but I am fascinated by why some people are literally frightened of receiving compassion but it's definitely a phenomenon yeah mm. so we have to help them to receive it I guess thank you yeah Olivier okay. uh thanks and thank you very much for the previous questions and and thank you very much Fiona for a great presentation um, I was wondering, in the corporate world, um, we talk a lot about um, uh, emotional intelligence as opposed to other kinds of intelligence. There's also all sorts of training for, an, an, you know, unconscious bias. And, and you know, this sort of 
processed process driven and and sort of um you know a, a process to learn how to i guess fill some of these boxes that would in the end create some sort of empathy which may feel like it's an artificial process but actually if you force people to think and stop and start to you know have data points about things actually you know i think it can make a difference what, what's your what's your view on that in terms of you know, either these programs are worth it or are they worthless? Have they been going on for a long time and no results been shown? I mean, and it'd be interesting to see what um, what came out of your research or your your thoughts about that. Thank you. Yeah, so um, so it's really interesting about um, courses to develop empathy and compassion. Um, they are fundamentally different. That's why I said before, we need to be careful about how we focus our efforts to help people become more compassionate. Um, there is evidence that where people um, try to develop empathy, it actually fires a different part of the brain to if you try to help people develop compassion. Um, and empathy can, can link into sort of the, the fear zone in the brain. I don't know the exact details, but it can actually do more harm. That's why I mentioned before about there are problems with empathy um, because uh, there are circumstances where you know if you see someone in pain you can actually physically sometimes feel that because empathy can be so strong between people and that's when you are feeling with someone else so if you teach someone to do that it can actually be quite damaging what we want is to be able to teach people to generate warmth and care for for other people without that feeling with them which can be harmful. Um, and when we do that, it fires a different part of the brain, which is more associated with reward. Um, and, and so it's a more positive outcome for the person, therefore demonstrating compassion. So that was a probably really a, a really clumsy way of describing it if there's any neuroscientists in the room. Um, but basically there are ways and, and there are um, uh, evaluated courses on developing compassion. So I've mentioned a few in the Compassionate Work Toolkit, and I'm sure there have been more since then, actually. Um, so there are ways to do it, but we have to be careful at the approach that we take. Um, I do think more generally, um, you know, that there's we need to help people to, to develop their own self-awareness of how they are and how they impact on other people. And I think that's really critical. We do that um, in the NHS course that I deliver. You know, what's it like to be on the receiving end of you? You know, let, let's really get into that and let's ask the people round about you um, and, and really generate that self-awareness and, and really helping people to understand why they are the way that they are. Um, you know, back to Beverly's point about what, why is it that some people don't want compassion? We need to help people to understand themselves better. And there are exercises you can do around that, around lifelines and understanding all your life experiences, which have come to shape you to be the, the way that you are. Um so I think there is lots that we can do, but we, you know, I think there's lots more evaluation of, of the methods um, out there that we have been using. They're not always positive, I have to say. Um, as I say, certainly not that developing empathy can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I don't have a comprehensive answer for you on that one, but I think that the, more, oh, the typical academic answer, we need more research. <laughs> I think that, so, oh, Beverly, sorry, do you want to come back? Yeah, I just wanted to add something there that I think I might have got the wrong end of the stick here, but I think one of the things that we can do around developing empathy and self-awareness is about, it is that reflective piece, but it's also about understanding our own reaction, our own systemic reaction. How are we when, uh, let's take the people, for example, that can't receive compassion. What's actually going on on the inside when they can't receive percent reaction? What's happening in their body? How are they closing down? So bringing attention to things like how, how am I when I'm holding difficult emotion or when I'm overwhelmed by sensation? And then what tools and strategies have I got to actually be able to hold more of that and to receive more of that? And then over time, what that means is that we learn to develop a greater self-compassion and ultimately greater empathy because we can hold more. It stops us shutting down and pushing away. So it's about developing our own individual internal tolerance for discomfort quite often. And then when we can do that, it's easier to extend towards others and feel others' feelings. Yes, without it being damaging. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes. I love that. And, and that is, like I said before, about that, that really developing self-awareness, just exactly mm. what you've described there. What is it that I'm feeling? Why am I feeling it? And once you understand it, then you can do something with it. Yeah. Can you? What's, what's it taking care of? 
yeah and can I let that go because that may not serve me anymore yes anyway, I'll yeah stop it yeah and that's what i mean there's there's so much complexity that sits behind it you know, there's a lot of complex human psychology which sits behind it but we have to start somewhere you know even though we don't understand it all completely we have to start somewhere so we can start small um, and, and keep chipping away <laughs> ever the eternal naive optimist <laughs> just just picking up before uh, goes back to steve there's two bits i mean there's, a, there's three things really one is probably a whole different topic on its own which is in there in chat about uh, the education system um which i agree I and mean, i think that's a fun there's some pretty big issues in there um associated with you know steve put a question in about ofsted but beverly's come back with a really useful uh, addition to it um, I mean, I think there's also in fact, Steve as well who put a question in about social media and and a somewhat I think it was supposed to be tongue in cheek comment about as left showing compassion by going on strike over Easter. I mean, I do think there's a piece around external dynamics that are, are a factor in this as well. That you know people are you know becoming more. I suppose, in, uh, immune uh, from having human normal feelings because of some of the stuff that does go on and it seems to be normalized in social media and things like that. I think the union thing is an interesting example because that clearly is, you know, that does send a pretty negative message to, mm. uh, you know, to a lot of people in society. And, and it's just a, uh, another interesting dimension that, that adds pressure, I guess. But what are your thoughts, Fiona? Oh, yeah, <laughs> um, I think yeah, the, the, we we're more polarized than ever, aren't we? You know, and and a lot of that is you know driven by by social media, um, and so there's something about how do we come back, how do we come back to the middle to have that better understanding of one another, and that better understanding of why people do the things they do, and that suspending judgment, seek to understand each other, seek to work together. Um, you know that we need to do more of that and and I mean I always go back to it starts it starts with parenting and then it you know then we need to work on the school so I know I'm talking about compassion at work which is like kind of it's almost too late isn't it <laughs> you know we need to start so much earlier polarizing is just it is you know it's just the most un unhelpful thing and I think we can develop much much more compassion for one another when we really understand one another when you get to know one another there's a fantastic story isn't there and i can't remember the names unfortunately the people involved but um a black man who befriended a member of the the kkk in america um and and really worked hard you know to build a friendship and eventually the the kkk guy left the organization because over time he realized how ridiculous his views were and um, because he came to know the other person as a human being um and I, I just think that that's where we need to focus our efforts you know about that every everyone on equal terms all humans all life of equal value but we need to start well before we get into work you know to do that that that's it starts in families and in schools um my goodness if anybody wants to take on that task that would be marvellous. <laughs> Longer conversation. Steve. <laughs> Fabulous evening. You're a great communicator, Fiona. You've got a a, a lovely voice, a lovely smile, and it, it helps so much on an extremely serious and challenging subject. Uh, uh, great questions from you lot. Thank you very much. One of the things I would, would have posed to Alan, wonderful Alan Haywood, was what compassion was shown by his working with hedge funds, American hedge funds. I should think that would be a subject in its own right. But anyway, it's been a fabulous evening. Thanks to everyone for attending. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you for next week, I hope, for another great presentation, this time from Steve McCann. But for now, put your hands together and let's say thanks to Fiona. I'm looking forward to having her back sometime. She's a regular attender. Thanks also for the great questions. And we'll see you next week. All the best and bye for now. Thanks bye. so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.